It's very uh, enjoyable and a pleasure to be here. And thank you and the Jackson Laboratory for the invitation to speak today. I'll be limiting my presentation mainly to the data that's presented uh, in the paper manuscript that we published in July of this year called Leveraging Gene Therapy to Achieve Long-Term Continuous or Controllable Expression of Biotherapeutics. But first, I want to give some background and We'll also make some conclusions and uh, at the end, so I appreciate everyone's attention. You can see the logo in the upper right corner of the slides, the Pediatric Ohio uh, Cancer Immunotherapy Center. This is uh, partly a source of funding for this project as part of the Cancer Moonshot grant. We had a U54, or still have for that. And also, uh, as you'll see on the final slide, uh, a number of other funding sources, including technology development funds from Nationwide Children's Hospital. So first, a disclosure, as Sam mentioned, I'm a co-founder, board member, shareholder of BioNexus Biotherapeutics, hold an exclusive license from Nationwide Children's Hospital regarding the technology that I will discuss today. Not relevant to this presentation, I do serve as chair of a data safety monitoring board for a clinical trial of a, a, of a drug in adult fibromatosis. My clinical practice is as a sarcoma doc, uh, and then I've done some one-time consulting fees over the past two years for several other uh, companies that were developing drugs for adult cancers that are not relevant to my clinical practice. And I won't be discussing any uh, off-label use of any drugs. But first, I must start really by acknowledging the team members who have made this all possible, who work in my laboratory. Uh, all of them are very vital to our work and play cr critical roles. For this particular project, uh, the biggest contributors were Mark Courier, Ping Yi Wong, Chun Yu Chen, and Brian Hudson. Uh, again, with contributions from the others you see on the screen, and I'll be uh, putting their names on the slides as we go along to specific areas that they contributed. And I'm indebted to all of them for their hard work in the laboratory. We've also collaborated with our Genomics Institute, the Nationwide Children's Hospital Institute for Genomic Medicine, led by Elaine Martis, who's the former uh, uh, chair of the uh, American Association for Cancer Research. And uh, the, those individuals listed played important roles in, in some of our genomic studies. And a number of our other studies that I won't be discussing today use single cell RNA-seq. And that's uh, led by Ryan Roberts, who's an independent investigator in our center and uh, has been vital for us uh, utilizing that technology. So first, let me start with the problem. Every good science project needs to start with a problem. What are you trying to address? And ours is a fundamental problem of drug pharmacokinetics. And this is from an, uh, a relatively old uh, clinical pharmacology textbook, the image, and it plots the number of cancer cells in log scale uh, in the red line, as you can see. And uh, I will try to pull up a, a cursor here that, uh, is a reasonable that, that you can see. And the red line is the number of cancer cells. And you can see that you really need a fair number of cancer cells in the body that is on the order of 10 to the ninth in order to cause any kinds of problems or be detectable. Uh, and certainly over 10 to the 10th to really cause symptoms. And finally, when you reach in the area of 10 to the 12th, that can result in cancer death. Now, a variety of different kinds of treatments can drop those numbers down. Surgery obviously can remove a big bulk of the tumor, uh, but still usually not all, every single cell. Chemotherapy can remove some, radiation can remove some different kinds of treatments. So if successful, you remove a little bit with each chemotherapy cycle, uh, but you can see some of it can grow back in between because chemotherapy cycles uh, are episodic. Uh, you have to let the bone marrow or other uh, at, organs recover between each cycle of chemotherapy, and that allows time for tumor cells to regrow. And if it's not working very well, it, it may regrow too much, as shown in the purple line, and actually result in tumor progression, and uh, that's what we want to avoid. And with cancer, we know that we have to get every single cell, and every getting every single cell in the body, uh, every single cancer cell, takes a long period of time. Uh, and multiple, multiple cycles. And so dr most drugs have short half-lives. Small molecules are often in the, in the range of hours. Small proteins can be in the range of hours or, or, or a few days. They require repeated or continuous infusion. 
which requires frequent hospital or clinic visits. And as I've shown in this diagram, each dose only kills a fraction of cancer cells. That's the log kill hypothesis. And those troughs of levels in the bloodstream or in the tissues enable cells to regrow, enable the development of resistance. And the treatment time is long, as I mentioned. For most of my patients that I treat with sarcomas, we treat uh, with cycles of chemotherapy every two to three weeks for up to 10 months or more. In acute lymphoblastic leukemia, we go two to three years with a maintenance therapy. Uh, so there's very intensive therapies up front and, and then maintenance, and that is required to really get every single cell. And for some chronic leukemias, it can be a lifetime of therapy. So we uh, think that uh, there are ways to do better with pharmacokinetics, that is, ways to achieve continuous uh, levels in the bloodstream. And that was the purpose of this paper, utilizing or leveraging gene therapy to do so. So it's because consistent steady state levels would really be ideal to be able to hit that therapeutic window where you have enough levels to have a treatment effect, but low enough not to have side effects. And we uh, turned our attention to the immunotherapy field in order to achieve this. And that is uh, utilizing T cells to kill tumor cells. Many of you may be familiar with the CAR T cell field since it's really been an explosive field over the last few years. And I had the honor of being on the FD advisory committee that reviewed the data for the first CAR T uh, uh, approval to Sagen Lec Lucil or, or um, Kim Raya. And uh, it's really based on the potency of T cells uh, killing tumor cells. And this is an experiment uh, using an insight platform with uh, tumor cells on the bottom. These are uh, uh, adherent cells, solid tumor cells, and the floating smaller dark cells in this image are the T cells. And if you follow this by taking an image every hour or two or a couple of days, you can see that the uh, if the T cells are activated against the tumor cells, uh, if they're, you see the tumor cells dividing and filling up the dish, but then the T cells are recognizing them, the T cells are proliferating, they're killing the tumor cells, and at the end of four days, all you see is T cells left. Uh, these are, again, the, the darker round floating cells. They've killed uh, virtually all of the tumor cells. And that's because in this culture, not only have we put T cells and the tumor cells, but we put a bispecific protein that links the two together and enables the T cells to kill the tumor cells. So it's a very potent technology. Uh, and But the problem with the bispecifics is they have a really short half-life. So I mentioned the CAR T cells. I've mentioned the bispecifics. Both of these are predicated on the idea that if you can connect a T cell to a cancer cell and activate that T cell, you can uh, uh, secrete granzymes and perforin and interferons and cytokines and TNF-alpha and kill the cancer cell. And that's worked very, very well for CAR T cells and bispecifics. Uh, and we've been very excited about these in the field of cancer immunotherapy, uh, but they have some limitations. Uh, the limitations for CAR T cells can happen at any step of the way. The main limitation is that it's a cumbersome process. One has to collect T cells out of the cancer patient. Sometimes they can have a poor yield since they're coming from a patient who's immunosuppressed. They have to be taken to a manufacturing facility and transduced with a gene that encodes the chimeric antigen receptor that uh, recognizes the antigen on the tumor cells. They have to be expanded in culture, returned and infused into the patient. And sometimes they don't last. Uh, when they do last, they can be very effective, but lasting a long period of time, at least six months or more, the data suggests, uh, is very important to induce full and durable remissions in these patients. The pharmacokinetic problem comes with the bispecific uh, that I mentioned, and that is, although these are off the shelf, they're just manufactured at a facility, uh, because of their short half-life, which for blenitumumab or blencyto, which is the only well, the was the only FDA approved one. Now there's another FDA approved by specific for multiple myeloma. And there's a growing number in this class. Uh, and these require either continuous infusion or frequent administrations. And with the continuous infusion, it requires replenishing the bag or the syringe several times a week. The patient has an IV for long periods of time for an infection risk. And because of these cumbersome details, this product is usually only used for uh, one 
or several months, at, uh, and then uh, the patient goes on to other therapies. So my uh, thesis is that we're not really getting the benefit of these bispecifics because they're not used long term like the CAR T cells are used. So blenitumumab, for example, as I mentioned, the half life is two hours. Uh, it's given in a ramp up fashion. So the first week, it's a, uh, a, a half a dose. And then after that, it's a full dose because of some of the side effects. Uh, but it's then given as a continuous infusion, usually for four weeks, and then uh, a, a week off or two weeks off. And we know the drug levels that are effective, uh, 731 plus or minus 444 picograms per mil. Some suggest higher levels are best for lymphoma. This is targeting CD19 on B cell uh, cancers. Uh, and it requires hospital stay and again, uh, frequent reinfusions or replenishments of the, of the product. And so its use, as I mentioned, is of limited duration. Most of the studies I've tallied here that were early on and that led to the registration uh, trials and, and, and to the approval of this drug involved uh, only a few cycles. So the average number of cycles in each of these uh, uh, trials was one or two. Occasionally patients got uh, four or five. Uh, I think one patient got up to nine cycles in the pivotal trial, the tower trial. And uh, these were each given with breaks. So there were periods of time when the patients actually were not exposed to the drug, which may allow the tumor cells to grow back as we talked about with the troughs in the pharmacokinetic problem. Now, a publication was uh, uh, published uh, last year by Mike Venaris comparing the CAR T cell with the bispecific uh, and uh, did a nice job of, of making sure that the two trials that he was analyzing had comparable patient characteristics and so forth. And he made the claim that the blenitumumab, the outcome of patients and the blenitumumab treated patients was inferior to those of the CAR -t treated patients, which it was in, in these studies. Uh, but what wasn't really pointed out too much was that uh, the CAR T cells represent continuous pressure, immunologic pressure on the cancer cells. Whereas, and that's represented by this long line because the, can the CAR T cells are in there and they're lasting. Whereas the by specific, it's intermittent pressure given cycles of four weeks on, two weeks off, and they were given five cycles. Uh, so only 20 out of the 30 initial 30 weeks of treatment were given, and then those patients uh, were, were not given those treatments. So it's a very different pharmacokinetic situation between these two. So blenitumumab used this way, yes, is quite inferior, but we posit that if it's used in a different way, a continuous uh, infusion way, uh, uh, it may be uh, not so inferior. So we uh, thought that systemic gene therapy using adeno-associated virus might be able to solve the problems of both of these amazing technologies. That is, we could take the attributes of each uh, single shot, a single infusion, and lasting a long period of time is uh, the main attribute of a CAR T cell, whereas the main attractive attribute of bispecifics is that it's off the shelf and that it's using fresh T cells in the sense that you're making T cells out of your bone marrow constantly, freshly made, well-fit T cells, as opposed to those that have been manufactured and shipped around. Uh, and so that might have another advantage. But we felt that we could uh, use systemic AAV therapy uh, to achieve these attributes. So our concept was simple make an AAV, we call it transjoin because it's producing a product that joins two cells and it's producing them from the trans gene of the virus and basically mimic uh, the blenitumumab bispecific to engage uh, a T cell with a tumor cell, give it through a single shot, have that virus go to various organs in the body such as the liver or muscle and produce uh, the uh, protein in the bloodstream, make it a secreted protein not unlike the hemophilia gene therapy field where the virus goes to the liver and produces a secreted protein to treat hemophilia. But in that case, it's treating a deficiency of a, or a mutated gene that's congenital deficiency. In this case, we're trying to produce a therapeutic. And so you may be very well familiar with the AAV life cycle. 
the virus binds a receptor. It is uh, encapsulated in an endosome, just as the video intro video of this webinar showed. The virus then translocates to the nucleus. Uh, the capsids are broken apart, so this capsid should probably be not on this part of the diagram. There's uncoding. Uh, well, there it is, and forms an episomal DNA that it remains in the nucleus is is for the most part not integrated into the genome that can happen sometimes and produces an mRNA continuously into the a cell. In our case, we wanted it to be secreted out of the cell. So we were forming, we were starting this with the, on the basis of that a AAV gene therapy is now a reality. People have been talking about this since the 80s and 90s, uh, and it's now a reality. That is AAV therapy is FDA approved. Look, Sterna was a, a treatment uh, using AAV therapy or a congenital retinal dystrophy. It is a local injection into the retina, but uh, Zolgensma is a systemic injection into the bloodstream, which was FDA approved in 2019 for spinal muscular atrophy and uses an intravenous dose of 1.1 times 10 to the 14th genome copies per kilogram of body weight and been, has been really a transformative development for these kids who would otherwise not be able to grow up, not be able to walk, not be able to breathe, and uh, mostly are, are dead after a few years of age. So this has been very transformative and for the most part safe. And other AAVs are advanced clinical testing. We now have an FDA approved treatment for hemophilia that, that has happened since the slides were made and submitted to Jackson Laboratory. So the field is moving very fast and there are other, a lot of other diseases that are being addressed by AAV gene therapy. So we felt that this technology was somewhat de-risked, as it were, by merging a number of proven technologies, that is, unregulated, long-term anti-CD19 therapy, that is, Kimraya or Tisagenelec Lucil, anti-CD19 bispecific gene therapy, which is Glincido or Blinitumumab, and Zolgensma, which is systemic AAV gene therapy, all three FDA-approved therapies, and we were just combining them in a, in a unique way to uh, utilize the best attributes of each. So we first set out, and this now we have reached uh, the manuscript that I mentioned, uh, uh, creating these vectors, and we created a variety of different ones to test, uh, as we weren't sure which might work best. We made a coding sequence uh, that encodes the bispecific, a, a single chain variable fragment against CD19, which is present on B cell uh, malignancies, as well as normal B cells. It, must not be forgotten. Uh, so this will attack normal B cells as well. Uh, and, and linked to a SCFV against CD3 on T cells uh, as part of the T cell receptor and can trigger T cells to be activated. We also created a strong promoter in this particular instance from the chicken albumin beta globin uh, a synthetic promoter, uh, included a COSEX consensus sequence for, MR, for uh, ribosome binding and translation. Uh, we also then made a version without a secretion peptide and with a couple different varieties of, of uh, peptides that were designed to uh, be signal peptides for secretion. And uh, based on a publication that had suggested the presence of zero, one, or two alanines uh, between the, the peptide, signal peptide and the coding sequence could change and be uh, the amount of expression and that some proteins, uh, that worked better for some proteins to have one or two or zero, uh, and, and it only could be defined empirically. So we made these plasmas that encoded this construct, these different constructs, put them into 293 T cells in culture, collected supernatants from the cells, and uh, put those supernatants in various kinds of assays. Uh, one of the assays was to confirm binding, and that is where we uh, used antibodies against CD3 or antibodies against CD19 that we could detect in flow cytometry and then asked whether this product or this supernatant could compete for binding on, if it was CD3, onto T cells, which we used TALL cells for, or onto B cells, which we used uh, Raji cells, which are derived from uh, Burkitt lymphoma. And this is an example of the flow cytometry uh, where the uh, unstained is shown in gray. Uh, if you stain it with the anti-CD3 antibody only, you get a shift to the right, as you can see with the red on the bottom. And then uh, various constructs, uh, GFP control, media only, uh, no 
uh, signal peptide, all three of these really co-localized with uh, the anti-CD3 only, suggesting there was no competition for binding. Whereas all three of the ones that we made using a uh, con consensus secretory domain, secrecon, uh, by itself or with the addition of one or two alanines, all three competed similarly for binding uh, to the CD3 uh, positive cells, that is the TALL cells. And we also showed that similar competition was found with CD19, um, and both competitions for uh, to bind CD19 cells or CD3 cells, uh, positive cells, uh, was dose-dependent in terms of how much of the supernatin we added. We call the protein that is connecting two cells a, a dimert uh, as a short name for a small protein that connects two cells. And so this is the dimer concentration. As that increased, we got more and more competition. So that validated the binding of the product that's produced from these vectors and proved that we do need the secretory domain to secrete it out of the cells. So now we turn to the humanized mouse models. Uh, we obtained from Jackson Labs the humanized NSG, SGM3 or NSGS mice for short that contain uh, are transgenic for uh, st steel factor, stem cell factor, GMCSF and L3. Uh, created by Jim Malloy at Cincinnati Children's to uh, enable uh, human cells to engraft better. And these mice are prepared by Jackson Labs. Uh, they undergo total body irradiation. Uh, human CD34 uh, hematopoietic stem cells are injected into the tail vein. And then they're monitored for the development of uh, the blood components. Uh, and so they have human bone marrow. And so they generate essentially a human, for the most part, a human immune system. Uh, the other option was to use NSGS mice that are injected with human peripheral blood mononuclear cells, or PBMCs, which are collected from normal donors, and we purchase from another vendor. Uh, and these create circulating human white blood cells in addition to the mouse uh, monocytes uh, that are still present in these animals, uh, but they're not generating new cells from the bone marrow, unlike the NSGS mice. So there are two different ways. Uh, these mice tend to be cheaper on the right, but uh, they tend to get more graft versus host disease uh, than the mice on the left. So there are pros and cons as with anything with different models. So we first used the humanized, fully humanized mice uh, and tested our ability to just uh, get rid of the B cells. So these are no tumors, no leukemia, no lymphoma, just proof of concept. Could we give a dose of the adeno-associated virus encoding uh, the blenitumumab mimic uh, and uh, see ablation of B cells, which is what we also see in human patients when given uh, this bispecific. And at various doses, 5e to the 10th genome copies per kilogram, 5e to the 11th, and 5e to the 12th, we were able to see uh, B cell ablation. It was more rapid, the higher virus dose, uh, but in all cases it was, and these are single mouse experiments, and then we measured the blood uh, by flow cytometry for T cells uh, of CD4 or CD8 marking or CD20 positive B cells. And you can see that the B cells were ablated in all cases. And notably, we're using fairly low doses of virus. As I mentioned, the Zolgensma requires 10 to the 14th genome copies per kilogram because they're trying to get every motor neuron in those patients, whereas we only need to hit a subset of cells to secrete enough protein. So we don't need to hit every cells in any given organ. You also notice that we did get some proliferation of CD4 B cells, uh, but not really, and, and a little bit of the CD8 B cells. And these uh, proliferations seem to settle out over time uh, at back to a, a, a steady state level that was more akin to the uh, pre-treatment uh, levels. We think this is because we are constantly, uh, you are attacking the normal B cells, uh, and at first, that's a big job when you're ablating those, but then uh, over time, they're just attacking the new ones that are coming out of the bone marrow. And so there's not a, a, a big pool of cells uh, that are activating the T cells. Our initial experiment for anti-tumor efficacy was to look at that Burkitt model, and we just did it actually in, in two mice, one that was treated with control and one that had... Uh, uh, a tumor implanted on the flank. We waited to give treatment. 
until the animals had sufficient tumor burden, about 300 millimeters uh, cubed. And we gave five e to the 12th genome copies per kilogram. And in the control mouse, we saw uh, growth, rapid, fairly rapid growth of the tumor. And in the treated mouse, we saw shrinkage. And we noted that it took a while. So you look at this, it took over 50, 60 days for this 300 millimeter tumor to, to shrink. And this is a theme that we've seen with this treatment. And we think it takes time to chip away at a tumor that's growing. Uh, and so this speaks to the need, particularly in lymphoma models or solid tumor models for long-term treatment, for long-term expression. Uh, the tumor cells that aren't being killed right away are probably dividing, replenishing it. So it's a bit of a race. Can you kill the cells faster than they can grow? We then turned to the other model, the PBMC model, uh, because we could do much, many more mice uh, quicker and, uh, and a little bit cheaper, to be honest, uh, and gave a single dose of the adeno-associated virus expressing the bispecific. Uh, and this time we used uh, Raji cells that had been transduced with luciferate, with, sorry, with a, a lentivirus expressing luciferase, and then give the animals luciferin that can first to a uh, to product that's detectable uh, the photo that emits photons and detectable on an IVIS imager. So you can see the tumors of the various colors. You can see the scale bar here on the right for the photons. And uh, on day seven, all of the mice had tumors. They continued to grow in nearly all the mice, all but one, I guess, uh, uh, had tumors on day 14. And then we started seeing shrinkage in the treatment groups. And the control groups, I should say, are, are various different uh, vec control vector or vector uh, or PVCs alone and so forth. But when we had the vector and the PVCs together, that's the treatment groups. And you can see in those treatment groups that the tumor shrank and disappeared uh, in the treatment groups, whereas we had to sacrifice due to tumor burden all of the animals uh, by day 35 in the control groups. Uh, this was a very gratifying experiment uh, because this is the PBMCs given to the animals, we do uh, get graft-versus-host disease. You can see that some of the animals on the ends of the experiments are starting to look a little bit smaller than others, and they're experiencing weight loss. And so uh, that makes these experiments somewhat time-limited. We couldn't watch them very long. And it depends on the source of PBMCs, how uh, the timing of the graft-versus-host disease. This is another experiment. Oh, and I'm going to go back one slide just to note that uh, we did see, remember, we did see growth initially for the first two weeks, and, and we'll, we'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, so uh, we also uh, used, did, did an experiment where we waited until the tumors got a bit larger to give the treatments. So this is day 10. This is now, um, again, th this shows you the different control groups, either PBMCs alone, the vector alone. A, a GFP vector with the PBMCs or the AAV bispecific with the PBMCs. And you can see these animals lasted much longer. Uh, we did have to sex, uh, we did lose one animal to anesthesia and a couple animals to graft versus host disease uh, early on, even though their tumors were shrinking. You can see quantification of this, uh, these animals and their tumor growth across the top by photons. And again, you can see how long it takes for them to shrink, uh, 60, 70, 80 days. The tumor volume is plotted by calipers, similar uh, findings over here on the right. Again, uh, shrinkage takes some time, um, 50 days by that. And uh, the animals uh, were gaining weight until they started losing weight, which is uh, indicative of graft versus host disease. And we confirmed that their organs looked like graft versus host disease. Now, we did a biodistribution study and found that the AAV genome was found mainly in the heart and liver and skeletal muscle and a little bit elsewhere as well. So it, it goes uh, in a wide variety of places, which can be advantageous for systemic gene therapy. And in our case, uh, we didn't seek to limit expression just to the liver, for example, because we want to be able to give as low a virus dose as possible to uh, minimize those side effects. Now this speaks to the pharmacokinetics, and this was theoretical that the time to there's going to be a, a therapeutic window where you need to reach a certain level for efficacy, but
but you don't want to get too high. And what is that time to efficacy? And what is that time to steady state? And when we look at hemophilia patients, we know that that can take eight to 12 weeks to reach steady state uh, for uh, in clinical trials in, in humans. Uh, in our mice, uh, it took about uh, two weeks. So we you don't get any expression over the first day or two, and then you see a slow rise of the expression until you reach steady state, and we're uh, well into the range above which actually where you need to be for uh, the uh, blinitumumab. Uh, we used an assay we developed in-house uh, that used blinitumumab as the standard curve, and so we call this blinitumumab equivalence in the, in the serum. Uh, and then we got long-term uh, expression. When we give it to both females and male mice at different levels, uh, we can see a dose-dependent uh, in this particular experiment, two times 10 to the 11th didn't give us detectable levels, but two times 10 to the 12th did, and two times 10 to the 13th gave us even higher levels. You'll note that we got about a threefold increase in serum levels with a tenfold increase in uh, genome copies per kilogram. Uh, and we got similar levels in males and females. Um, in this case, we actually gave all the mice the uh, same uh, dose. Uh, and so the uh, females end up getting a little bit higher dose per kilogram, uh, uh, or we adjusted for the kilogram. So they got a little bit higher actual dose is what I'm trying to say. Um, and we have found now in other studies that you actually do get a little bit lower level in, in females than males. And um, if you gave them all the same dose that isn't uh, attributable by uh, uh, just the amount per kilogram, but that's sort of an aside we didn't address in this paper. Uh, their weights are all uh, lasted well, and the other uh, are, are sort of you know maintained because these animals don't have uh, the foreign T cells given to them. This is just without any tumor. Uh, and in this particular experiment, we watched them up to a year, and so they basically had the same levels a, a year after uh, the first set of levels uh, at the beginning. So uh, very uh, robust, uh, consistent steady state, very gratifying. We did a similar experiment where we harvested the animals at day 21. We didn't really see any uh, adverse events in terms of blood chemistries or mouse chemokines or cytokines um, uh, in, in, in them looking for any signs of toxicity. Uh, and we did see proliferation of human T cells, both CD4 and CD8, in the treatment group, uh, but not in the control groups. Uh, and we're now developing a program where we're trying to uh, target multiple antigens at once with one sort of a tri-specific that we still would call it a dimer because it combines uh, joins two cells to each other, but a tri-specific dimer where we're trying to target multiple antigens on the same cell, uh, both to get more uh, increased efficacy, but also to um, minimize the chance of antigen escape. A cell can escape this treatment by downregulating CD19, but if it has to escape uh, both of the expression by both, we think that is going to be harder for a cell to do. Now, just a pictorial uh, comparison of the three technologies I've discussed, CAR T-cells, BITES, uh, or Blincyto, bispecific T-cell engagers, and transjoin, which is what I'm talking about. Uh, for, in terms of access, this is cumbersome manufacturing, you need to harvest T-cells and manufacture them for each patient, and sometimes they don't work whereas both of these are off the shelf in the freezer. Uh, delivery, CAR T cells have to be given uh, after some chemotherapy to make room for the new cells to uh, persist. So that can be problematic. You don't need to do that with bispecifics or our transjoint gene therapy. The duration of CAR T cells is long lasting, whereas bispecifics is short and transjoint is long lasting, as well as use, utilizing fresh T cells coming out of the merit marrow on a continuing basis. So those are the advantages of our technology. Some of the disadvantages or the potential challenges can either come from the adenovirus uh, delivery or the bispecific uh, that's being expressed. The adenovirus uh, delivery, there can be anti-AAV antibodies pre-existing or certainly after getting this and precluding a second dose. So it's really a one-time shot. There can be some immune response to the capsid proteins and causing hepatopathy. And at high doses, one can get complement activation. And some patients have gotten very sick. Uh, from the uh, 
protein that's expressed, there can be anti-drug antibodies, although that's very rare with blincyto because we're uh, depleting the normal B cells as well, uh, but it may be an issue with uh, tar other targets. There can be cytokine release from the activation of T cells and neurotoxicity, and both of these are also seen with CAR, CAR T cells. Now, there are uh, antidotes or uh, strategies to, comp uh, to combat each of these. Uh, there are a number of things being tested to either uh, transiently get rid of uh, pre-existing antibodies against the virus that might uh, preclude systemic delivery or limiting patients to those who have uh, low levels of such antibodies. Steroids can be used to treat the hepatopathy. The complement activation has really only occurred at high doses, so we don't think that'll be an issue with our technology since we use a 100 to 1,000 fold lower doses. Uh, the anti-drug antibodies are unlikely with B cell ablation, but could occur with uh, products against other targets. And there are antibodies for cytokine release, such as anti-IL-6, that can be work, uh, that can be very useful. And then for neurotoxicity, what's used mainly is supportive care uh, until it subsides with CAR T cells or other drugs are being tested, like anakinra and others, uh, based on the source of the neurotoxicity. Now. Uh, we also, in this paper, said, how, how else could we deal with those toxicities? Is there a way, a way we could control gene expression? Uh, and so we, we looked at that and thought about it and said, you know, there's two possibilities. You could have a, a default where it's off and that you just turn it on when you need it, or a default where it's on and then you turn it off or dim it uh, when you run into trouble. Uh, we don't, there may be ways to go permanent on or off uh, but um, the way we came up with was to utilize RNA splicing. Uh, and we published a review recently about RNA splicing that discusses this, if you want to see more, read more about it. But basically, uh, RNA splicing is, has been well described and well known as a process regulated by splicing proteins and the spliceosome. And uh, generally, splices out introns uh, based on the recognition of of uh, sequences and junctional sequences so that uh, one can, uh, a normal introns are spliced out to give a gene exon one, two, three, but you can interfere with the binding of those proteins and either include a new intron or exclude an intron uh, and, and get a protein that's just uh, missing one of those introns. And antisense exon skipping, as it's called, is a reality. In 2016, Spinraza was approved to treat the uh, SMN2 for spinal muscular atrophy, pre-RNA to basically get rid of the defective exon 7 and translate a protein that works pretty well, even though it misses exon 7. And then uh, also in 2016 for Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, for exon 51 mutations uh, that result in a premature stop codon. If you skip that, you can get a um, closer to full length uh, protein. And so, uh, these have been validated as a technology. Uh, and there are many others, as I've shown here, FDA-approved drugs utilizing either exon skipping or uh, in interfering RNA to modulate uh, RNA um, uh, in, in patients. So we thought we could create a uh, version of this within our transgene, and that is create an artificially engineered exon in the middle of the transgene that's a it has stop codons in all three reading frames, and that is included at baseline uh, with the, the process of splicing as the protein is being expressed. We call this transkip uh, for obvious reasons and where the default would be off. And then if we add a antisense morpholino that would interfere with the spliceosome, it would skip that and uh, give us the full length transgene expressed. Uh, and we also have uh, thought about but not yet tested, sort of the opposite, where we engineer artificial introns into the transgene that are spliced in so that it's on at all times, and then skip the middle in exon to cause it to turn off. Now, we thought that would be a tougher lift compared to the one on the left, because on the left, we would only need to bind a minority of AAV transcripts to start producing the product. Whereas if we really wanted to shut it off in a significant way, we would have to bind a majority of AAV transcripts for the situation on the right. So in this paper, we uh, did proof of concept experiments uh, just for the, the one on the left, but would like to continue developing those 
as shown on the right. So in this experiment, when we designed this technology for cancer, we also thought we could kill two birds with one morpholino. That is, if we uh, have an intron, an artificial intron, exon, intron structure in our transgene, and if that were to come from a normal gene that we wanted to turn off, like the most common oncogene in humans, KRAS, uh, the, that could be an advantage. And so we actually took the intron sequences that flank exon one of the KRAS gene where the transcription start site is and decided we would target that exon so that if, if we could skip that exon, you might not have translation initiation, sorry, trans, trans, yeah, translation initiation of the KRAS protein and get either a short truncated or, or a, uh, a, a non-protein, it wouldn't have the initial exons in it. It might initiate transcription on a, a cryptic uh, start site internally. Uh, and it, that if we had the same exact sequences, but engineered with stop codons in the middle of that exon, but the same sequences flanking it, we, the same morpholino would activate our therapeutic. So we thought we could activate a therapeutic and target an oncogene at the same time. And uh, th at first, and I'm going to start going through these slides pretty quickly because we're we're going to run short on time, but I re refer you to the paper for more details, and I also want some time for question and answers. Uh, so uh, the turn on worked well in terms of a dose dependent morpholino gave us increasing amounts, but it also was very leaky. You can see the band here in the mock. It's just to the point that when we did the competing competition experiments for CD3 stained uh, T cells. All of them, including the mock, uh, competed for binding. Uh, and um, you could look at the different uh, transcripts, whether it's spliced or not, by RT-PCR. Uh, and so we made a number of mutations uh, with Don Chandler's help, who's a RNA splicing expert, in the uh, spliceosome uh, binding sequences uh, for the UA U2AF splicing factor, which is upstream of the intron, even though we're targeting the, fact, the, the spliceosome downstream. But the idea here was to strengthen the splicing so that we didn't have leakiness um, uh, at baseline, but then we could interfere with that down here with the morpholino. And indeed, when we made various uh, base pair alterations in that splicing factor binding site, we achieved uh, very tight splicing where we didn't see uh, the uh, leaky transcript, the skipped a transcript in some of these, like a KM3 shown here. So there's no binding with the mock, but then we get binding, dose-dependent binding when we add morpholino. So that was very gratifying. We thought this KM3 construct was the best of those. Uh, and we used it in vivo, where we created a, uh, a transkip uh, AAV vector that we gave to mice, the same time we gave the constitutive expressing one. And you can see that if we give a morpholino control, uh, we don't get expression that's in the green at the bottom, but if we give uh, a morpholino that's targeted to the exon, we get stimulation of expression. And uh, we found if we gave two doses, we get higher expression. These are two doses a day apart. And then we see that expression fade over the course of about a week to 10 days so that we could episodically turn on the AAV transcript that's lurking in the cells in the body so that we could do the default off and turn on in vivo. And we could get high enough levels, actually, and if you gave repeated doses here on the left, as shown by these arrows, we could sustain expression of that until we stopped giving it, and then it faded down. Uh, and it was sufficient to give us some control of tumor growth, slower tumor growth in the blue, uh, and uh, the the, the need to sacrifice animals was, was a slower need uh, when we treated those compared to the inverted control. Uh, but it wasn't as good as transjoint, which is way up here for the same virus dose and get better tumor control with transjoint. So uh, we haven't pursued that further yet, but uh, we are uh, thinking that there are other chemistries coming out, such as stereoisomer chemistries of morpholinos from developed by wave therapeutics and and other chemistries that will make uh, exon skipping even more efficient in the future. And we'll probably revisit this when those uh, that field advances a little bit further. Uh, somewhat to our dismay, 
uh, well, this this looked pretty good, uh, not to our dismay. We were able to skip the native KRAS exon one as shown here in a dose dependent fashion. This bottom band uh, is exon zero linked to two with exon one excluded. Uh, uh, it wasn't complete. You can still see the full link transcript. And in fact, when we looked at protein levels, which I'll show you in a minute, we were not able to see a diminishment of the KRAS protein. So that hitting the two birds didn't quite work as well as we had hoped, but that's science. And I think that's just a technological issue that um, if we do better with the skipping, we may do better with knocking down KRAS. We did confirm with our genomics colleagues listed here using PAC BioSeq, uh, where we could do long read sequences of each individual transcript, RNA transcript, and each of those are mapped here that uh, we could, uh, some of those transcripts had exon one skipped of the native KRAS gene, and this is in lung cancer cells. And so 37 of the 105 uh, exons or, or yeah, transcripts lacked an exon when we gave them uh, the cognate morpholino, but uh, with the inverted morpholino or just the uh, carrier endoporter alone that's bringing in this to the cells, we didn't see any transcripts that were lacking exon one. So that suggests that we can uh, hit the hit the native KRAS gene. We just weren't able to knock down protein levels, and we think that's just a matter of getting more efficient at the uh, splicing effects. So finally, uh, we have two open questions. So that that completed the discussion, or sorry, the data that was in the paper. Uh, but two things, major questions I wanted to bring up. One is, can this be effective for solid tumors? Uh, and there are a lot of barriers to immunotherapies in solid tumors. Targets are shared with normal tissue, so you got to have a good target. Target expression can be heterogeneous with, in solid tumors, and you need to be able to bind to the cells. There can be lots of immunosuppressive cytokines in the microenvironment and immune cell checkpoints and immunosuppressive cells like regulatory T cells and myeloid-derived suppressor cells. There's also competition for um, of immune cells for with tumor cells for nutrients. And there are physical barriers, disjointed vascular, resulting in uneven perfusion that might limit access of T cells and other immune cells to the tumor cells, as well as extracellular matrix. So there's a lot of barriers in solid tumors. We think some of these can be overcome, uh, and we are looking at uh, uh, developing uh, this technology against targets on solid tumors as well. Uh, open question two is whether these technologies could be used for other kinds of disease diseases besides cancer cardiovascular disease, rheumatologic disease, any other diseases. And my hypothesis is that yes, but several different uh, uh, criteria will need to be met. Namely that the express protein or the bispecific or tri-specific uh, needs to be non-immunogenic. Because if it uh, elicits uh, neutralizing antibodies, then it's, it won't work anymore. So you may only get transient um, uh, effects. Um, so, and it's unclear to me, but it's possible that continuous expression might induce tolerance. So even if something is, even if the protein is immunogenic, uh, it might be worth testing whether long-term expression of it uh, and, and maybe expression in the way this technology gives it, that is that it's a slow ramp up, uh, will induce tolerance over time. That's an unanswered question, I think, in my mind. And it may be due to how immunogenic is the protein. These are very small proteins, uh, because we're not true antibodies, they're not true bispecific antibodies that have an FC receptor. They're just the variable uh, regions that bind the antigen. So uh, they're not big, but there could be immune responses against those regions. Uh, Long-term expression needs to be tolerated. In the case of CD19, we're able to tolerate ablating our own B cells because we can give uh, intravenous immune globulin to patients monthly and restore their levels of immune globulin so that they can appropriately fight off and be immune to infections, and that has worked well in patients, but it should be recognized that those patients do have uh, a normal target uh, being hit, so they really don't have normal B cells in circulation. And so if you choose other targets against other cancers, uh, the target needs to be something that's tolerated or perhaps not very highly expressed on, on uh, normal cells. And then that therapeutic window needs to be achievable. You have to be able to get enough levels to have an effect, but not uh, too much that it's causing toxicity. So uh, in summary, AAVG transfer may be a suitable advantageous method for achieving long-term 
systemic expression of biologic therapies. It's off the shelf, it's single dose, there's consistent steady states, it exploits T cells freshly deployed from bone marrow, and there's a slow onset expression that may reduce acute side effects in the initial couple of weeks. The first clinical trial of CD19 transjoin, we're hoping uh, to, uh, I, when I made these slides, 2023, I think it's gonna be more like 2024. Uh, we're now testing transjoin in models of solid tumors, and we've shown that you can control expression with exon skipping as proof of concept. We don't have data yet for default on and turn off, but we hope to work on that soon. And uh, But we are also waiting for chemistry, antisense chemistries to improve, as I'm sure they will. As I mentioned at the beginning, the scientists in my laboratory have been very critical, and, um, uh, and as well as the students for this project, as well as many of our other collaborators for this project, particularly the Genomic Institute uh, folks, um, again, led by Elaine Martis. And we appreciate all the funding we've gotten. I mentioned the Moonshot funding and some of the Nationwide Children's Technology Development funding. And we're fortunate in pediatric cancer to have lots of private foundations to help us out. Uh, uh, Alex's Lemonade Stand, Cancer Free Kids, Solving Kids Cancer, St. Baldrick's Foundation. Um, we also got a Department of Defense grant for some of the trans skip work uh, and um, uh, previously have been funded by the FDA as well. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.